I got to tell my uh, Gene Kim story really quick. So about four and a half years ago, we ran the first DevOps days here in Mountain View. It was the first one in the U.S. I was at the original one in um, Ghent, which actually is next week. Um, but, um, so I'm sitting on a panel, and one of the jokers, one of my friends, makes fun about how old I am. So Gene, who I didn't know it was Gene at the time, says, oh, you don't look that old. I'm like, well, thank you, buddy. I get off the panel, and, uh, and Damon Edwards, who you saw yesterday, comes up to me. You know who that was? I'm like, uh, panel guy number three. And he's like, uh, he's like, no, that's Gene Kim. Like, the visible ops dude? Holy shit, I got to get his autograph. Sorry, I'll try not to curse, but. Good luck, John. Yeah, good luck. Thank you there. Um, you guys know me. The right hand side of they're troublemakers. Anyway, DevOps blind spots. Um, I'm going to one uh, quick plug. I just did a startup. I'll talk about it in a minute just for a second. But it's SDN for Docker. I mean, that, that sounds obnoxious, but. Um, if you actually want to learn about it, give me a holler. Bocce Galoop is the best place to get a hold of me. I was on kind of the organizing committee for DevOps days, so uh, we're good to go here. Um, so um, I'm going to do a, a, a quick run through of my life. <laughs> so um, actually, I spanned five decades in this crazy muck we call IT. Um, I actually, in high school, we actually had a mainframe, an IBM mainframe. Like, imagine that. And it was like 1978, and I actually hoofed tapes in, in uh, high school. How many people have heard of the product called Tmon MVS? Or Tmon CSS? One, just two. That's it, really? Uh, three, okay, yeah. Showing your age. The other people aren't raising their hand. I was actually the, one of the th third author on that product. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff. I spent a lot of years in Tivoli, doing Tivoli stuff. I wrote seven red books for, for IBM with Tivoli. I was actually one of the first cloud evangelists under Simon Wardley. How many people know Simon? If you don't know Simon, you should know him. He's awesome. Um, I got to be the ninth person in at Chef. Hopefully this isn't boring you. So I actually spent a fair amount of time uh, working at Ops Code, building a customer-facing business. I have this pleasure working with Damon Edwards on DevOps Cafe. Um, and uh, actually, I also worked with him at DTO Solutions for a little bit in a startup. And um, DevOps days. And my last thing was I, I went to work for a cloud management platform company called Astratus. We sold it to Dell. And my current startup is something called Socket Plane. And I will say there are two myths that are baloney. One is you don't have to live in a valley to do a startup. And two, you, you can be over 30. I'm 55. This is my 10th startup. OK, let's get into the story here. So um, how many people know, I can't really see, how many people know who th this guy used to work for? One, Knight Capital. Right? Uh, and and every, it's a cliche DevOps story now, but I figured, you know what? If I'm talking about blind spots, let's talk about the worst freaking IT blind spot ever heard. All right, so um, Knight Capital was uh, HFT, high frequency trading, um, uh, what they call um, latency arbitrage. Great book on this called uh, Flash, Flash Boys. Um, they basically had a $1.5 billion corporation. They had 17% of the market share for the NASDAQ NYSE and then the NYSE. Um, and so guess what happened one day? They were distributing a new program to eight servers. And one of the, the and, and guess what? They weren't using Chef or Puppet or anything. I'm pretty sure. I mean, nobody's talking about it, right? This is the, everybody wants to know what the real story is, right? But like, they couldn't have been using Chef and Puppet because guess what the technician did? Anybody? Forgot to get the eight server. And so if you understand high frequency trading, what it is, it's like phishing. So you, 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 do a, uh, you do a trade, right? And you try to, so you try to um, buy 100,000 shares of Microsoft. And they spread that out to like five different exchanges. And if the first one gets there four milliseconds, he, he sends a signal to the next one. And another what, what they do is they do this like phishing. Like they'll actually start algorithmically buying to catch the pattern. So this test program that was basically disabled on the eighth server got activated because guess what they else they did? They repurposed the flag, OK? And so now all of a sudden, this buying algorithm fires off. End result is they lose $400 million in three hours. They're out of business in 24 hours, right? So blind spots can be, you know, in any flavor, you know, catastrophic and deadly, right? And the good news is the blind spots I'm going to talk about today are hopefully not that bad. I just think the Knight Capital story is a really good hygiene story for our industry. Um, so I, I happen to know the gentleman after me is going to talk about software-defined infrastructure or SDDC, and I think that's an important DevOps discussion. Um, it, I, I'm going to do like a little scorecard. I'm, we think about the holy trilogy for um, 
or the Holy Trinity, sorry, for the idea of what we do. Compute, storage network, you know, some people call it converged infrastructure. In general, compute, we're green. I think based on the sessions we've seen over the last day and a half, right? Like, we're doing a pretty good job. In WebScale, we're doing a really good job. It sounds like enterprise, we're doing a pretty good job. We do infrastructure as code, things like that. Network, you know, not really my area of expertise. I'm going to give it a yellow. Not going to debate it with you, all right? But network, I will debate, is fire engine red. Like, it is a blind spot. And so that's the, the pretty much the discussion I'm going to talk about. And I'll give you some data points, right? So there's a large bank in New York that um, 10 years ago, if you walked into them, and actually I did, and you asked them what their server to sysadmin ratio was, they would say it was 1 to 100, right? 1 sysadmin to 100 servers. If you, walk, if you ask them what their net ops to network gear, let's call it a switch just for lack of a, you know, a billion ways to describe it, it was about a 1 to 100. Today you walk into that shop, they use an infrastructure as code product. They boast that their sysadmin to server ratio is 1 to 10,000. Anybody want to guess what their net ops to switch ratio is? 1 to 100, right? Um, that's a blind spot, right? Let's, um, in general, if we're doing compute reasonably well today, we can get compute resources in five minutes. Ten minutes if we have to converge them, two minutes if we don't give a rip what's on it, right? In some cases, in companies I've talked to, I just spent you know, the last year going around the globe talking to companies that are trying to do networking or kind of new like network or greenfield networking. I hear stories of three months to get network provisioned. The minute you have to do complex network things, in some cases it can take up to three months. Best case scenario is a couple of days, unless you've actually optimized for this way of thinking. In general, um, in general there are still large organizations the way they do networking today is cutting and pasting spreadsheets and running diffs to tell what their network configs look like across the spectrum. Big, large institutions. So, um, so the idea, one of the things that we've done in this industry, I think, pretty well, certainly in compute, and the reason I would say compute is green, is we've been shortening the gap between a developer and an IT resource that a developer needs, right? Like 10 years ago, I don't know how many years, we went from this kind of virtualization, from bare metal to virtualization, the gap was shorter. Cloud made that gap even shorter. I would argue, and I will argue later, that containers will make that even shorter. But like in general, in the compute resource, we've done a pretty good job as an industry is getting the developer closer to the IT resources they need. Anybody disagree with that? No. OK. So, but, but the thing is, I will still argue that in network, we still have that same 10-year gap. And if you ask, look at most network presentations today, they will actually talk about the network, you know, here we are still 15 years later, right? So what changed in compute? Like, why do you compute? Why is compute green for my scorecard, right? Compute is green because a couple of things, you know. I mean, the disaggregation of hardware and software was a major contributor. So eight years ago, I got to meet Luke Kinesis at Puppet. I begged him for a job for two years. He wouldn't give it to me. I begged Adam once, Adam Jacob from OpsCode, Chef, and he gave me a job. But I, eight to 10 years ago, I was trying to prophesize this way of doing this kind of infrastructure that a lot of people like accept and love today. And, and one of the things that has happened somewhere along the way, probably be, way, definitely before, but it was a major impact on people accepting this model, was the disaggregation. You know, back in the day, you got AIX and you got software from IBM. AIX and then you got the hardware. You got HP, you got HPUX. You got Sun, you got Solaris. And then all of a sudden, we actually just got Linux and we went out and got our own, own hardware, right? And it changed a lot. And then also web scale, you know, and back in the day you had Amazon. You know, when I, got to, when I went to OpsCode, the original, um, some of the original guys were actually ex-Amazon guys. Right? So they had been doing a different way of infrastructure with open source, things like CF Engine and things like that, right? Um, and, you know, the big guys like the Facebook and the, and the Amazons, and I don't know what the hell Google did, but, but um, they were running infrastructure as code. And as they left, it leaked out. We started using those technologies. Um, public cloud changed the concept of over-provisioning. You know, we talk about elastic computing. Well, the truth is, that was overhyped. But it did, it forced a reset on the industry about having to over-provision, right? And, uh, and then, you know, um, you know, Andreessen says software has eaten the world, right? Software has eaten our world. If you've been ops, software has eaten your world. And if it hasn't eaten your world, you probably need to find a new job. 
So why is this thing about the network all of a sudden a reality? Right? Well, guess what? If you've been paying attention, there are some really interesting things about the disaggregation of hardware and software for switches. Right? There are companies now, and I'll, I'll list a few later, that will actually sell you just software, and they say, go buy these um, particular hardware that have ASICs, commodity ASICs on it, and bang, you're in business. Well, very similar, right? It's happening now. It's happened within the last couple of years. Um, we're starting to see large web, you know, cloud titans starting to release how they're doing networking. The Googles. Google's released Kubernetes, right? Um, you know, we're seeing that stuff is spreading out very similar to what we saw in kind of web scale and open source for uh, compute. Private cloud computing has totally disrupted the enterprise from a network perspective. We're spinning on our heads. We thought that we could just get a cloud, plop it in, and everything was going to be hunky-dory. And then the network kind of people came, whoa, 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 what's going on over there? Right? And, and again, you know, if we think about software-defined networking and so STDI, SDDC, software-defined data center, software is also eating, it's eating every part of our industry. Here's some other meta points. In 1990, so if you hear people talk about SDN, they'll talk about um, northbound and southbound traffic or east-west traffic. So basically, these are general, the, the, uh, general numbers. In 1990, 95% of the data left the data center. Right? Um, and 5% and and, uh, and, and basically was east-west. Um, in 2010, some people would argue that 75% stays in the data center. And, and basically, in large container-based infrastructures, those numbers are going to be high as 95% east-west, 5%. So these are things that are definitely changing or become the potential blind spots if you don't recognize that this is happening. Another important point is what we call the edge has moved, right? The edge used to be a physical network device, right? It used to be a switch, maybe a top of rack switch structure, right? And then, but uh, now with hypervisors, and certainly with virtual switching fabric, the edge now is a host. It's a bare metal host, right? And so here's the thing, right? It was easier back in the day to say the network people did the physical stuff and the ops did the host. But now that host, who owns that host? Who owns V ports, virtual ports? Who owns logical networks? Who owns IP tables and Linux bridging? Right? It's great. And in fact, if there is, you know, I, I'm not going to trash OpenStack. I happen to like OpenStack, but if there's problem areas, like, don't look too far. It's a network. And of course, like everybody take a drink, I said Docker. Um, the, you know, Docker's going to make this worse or better, depending on what way you're looking at it, right? Like now there's no hypervisor. The host is just a bare metal. And hundreds become thousands. Virtual ports, virtual port hundreds become virtual port thousands. And, and if you're not getting the whole DevOps angle yet, it's an OPEX story. And it's a blind spot if you're not paying attention. And guess what? If you want to go to OpenStack and see what a compute node looks like on OpenStack, this is like the last release. That's your new edge. Now, whether it's an OpenStack compute node or it's going to be a Docker host, that could be, depending on how you do your network and how you think about network and how you apply software principles to networking. And, and by the way, it's nine hops to get from the VM out to the egress of that box. right? So I, I talked about uh, Linux. Uh, I talked about um, the new, um, you know, about you know the, the way uh, disaggregation of hardware, software, network devices, right? So Arista, very interesting company, um, really is a software company. They happen to give you hardware, but there's this move for software, and certainly bare metal, um, or in this case, Linux-based switches, right? You, the thing about it, if you haven't played with Arista, it's really cool. I mean, you go in and you run bash, and you're basically in a bash command, and all the things that you work with it are basically Python scripts. So all of those, if you've ever done any network stuff on a Cisco device, well, Cisco's going there too. Cumulus Networks is interesting. They're basically, um, they actually are a real disruptor in that they ship you just software, and you got to go buy your own hardware. Sound familiar? And then there's the OCP, Open Compute Project. Facebook is driving a lot of that. So let's talk about SDN. The elephant in the room, right? The blind man, the elephant, everybody. So SDN is a buzzword. Um, you know, everybody kind of gets, it's like DevOps, everybody wants to own it. 
But let's talk about SDN. So a traditional definition of SDN is, if we look at uh, traditional devices, basically you got a box, not very, very malleable. It had control plane and data plane. Data plane is the packet in, packet out wire speed. Control plane is the distributed brains of that data plane, right? Router protocols, things like that. Somewhere along the way, some people credit uh, Martin Casado from Nasira, who was bought for, by VMware for $1.2 billion, as the person who invented this. Other people would argue, I don't care. The idea was to separate the control plane from the data plane. And the point being that you can make the data plane programmable. Instead of doing this widgetry with router protocols, I say that in order to extend router protocols, you basically had to be born in 1950. You had to be a computer scientist who wore really thick black glasses, and then you could basically extend BGP or OSPF, right? But, but, the, so, but Martin said, like, hey, like any old fool can do a matching table on a data plane. And that's open flow. And there's other variants of that. But in general, that's the kind of traditionalist view of an SDN. I think it's a little better. I think there's a history here. One of my guys that works with me, he calls it a retro SDN. Like, we were doing really cool stuff with router protocols. Router protocols are really, really, like, really smart shit, right? Second time. No more, I promise. Um, the, uh, and I haven't said any really bad words neither, so I'm okay. And we talked about this last night at dinner. Um, so, um, so, but, but, so the idea is that you start building a programmable data plane. So not only can I now say, pack it in, go to port 48, pack it in, go here, but now I can do really clever stuff, like I can say, you know all those firewalls, that IP tables I've spread all over the place? I can put that service profile or policy logic into this data plane. And it becomes a programmable interface to an extraction. And the reason why you know, we refer to it as kind of retro SDN, and please don't like, use that as a term, um, is that what we did with, SD, with pure SDN is we basically made this assumption that this was the right way. It solved a big problem, but then it left everything, it threw the baby out with the bash water. Because the router protocols are pretty damn good. So like, I think there's a new convergence of SDN of taking a little of the old architecture, some of the new programmable uh, data path logic, and coming out with something new. Hint, that's something I'm working on. I and so, but if you think about that programmable data plane, what do we do now, right? We kind of go in, pack it in, or frame in, we go out to IP tables, we go out to IHA proxy, we go out to any function. So the idea is not only can we actually direct traffic, but we can actually put application services, like we can put firewalls, we can put load balancing. And that's what people, uh, VMware calls this micro-segmentation. Right? You can start consolidating that logic in a programmable way of the data plane. I think that's pretty cool. All right, so moving on, right? So those are a bunch of blind spots and opportunities, and if you're not paying attention, they're going to spur up in your organization. And hopefully now you have a general idea, or you already knew this, but you have a general idea what to look for. There's something else bigger on the horizon, and it's, um, it's basically what I call consumable composable infrastructure. But here's the Wikipedia def definition of, um, of composable infrastructure. I'm not going to read it. It's Wikipedia, bang. Here's the best example of consumable composable infrastructure. It's actually, uh, it's called the, the John Bentley's Challenge in 1986 to Donald Knuth. Basically, the challenge was to write a program that reads a file of text, determine those frequently used words, and print out a sorted list. And everybody's wrote programs and C programs and this programs. And one person basically took six Unix commands, put them together, and solved this problem. And the interesting thing was that None of those commands, like the unique or the sort, were designed to solve this problem. Right? They all interchange. And when we were done, they all got thrown away from the application standpoint. If that makes sense, you now checkbox understand microservices. Because that's the basically idea. You know, we talk about, you know, somebody talked about yesterday about Conway's law and programming. Like, microservices is a way to flip the way you think about things. Anyway, again, we could spend a whole session on this. I can't, I got eight minutes. So what happens? Why is this being driven, right? So if we look at the history here, um, you know, we got bare metal in eight weeks. We got virtualization in two weeks, all generalizations. Infrastructure as a service, two minutes. That's being real generous. Um, and, you know, past maybe one minute, but here's the thing. We start talking about containers, like 500 milliseconds. So if we think that eight weeks, and let's say infrastructure as a service is eight minutes. Let's, let's say that in order to chef it up or pup it up, it takes more than two minutes to get a virtual instance, right? If we think eight weeks to eight minutes was industry changing and oh my God, it changed everything, block cloud, 
that I will tell you that containers are making the same significant change in the way we think about time. Again, there's a lot more to be said about that. If you actually want to see some brilliant presentations, Adrian Krakow over there, just Google him if you don't know him. Uh, he is the, what I call the brains of uh, the data center future. So Docker. How many people have heard of Docker? Yeah, you're not as funny as I thought. So Docker is a commoditized version of containers. So people say, well, Linux containers have been around forever. Um, the thing that these guys did, like, yeah, just like cloud was around forever before Amazon, right? But they commoditized containers, right? And so a good friend of mine, Stephen Nelson Smith, wrote a book, Test Driven Development with Chef. He described how to do LXC on Amazon. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to do that. So every night after I put my kids to bed, by the way, I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm not even a horse in the unicorn horse thing. I, you know, I'm basically a pony, right? So I, uh, I basically, a big pony, but yeah, so, um, but the thing is, like, I tried to do that, and I gave up. Like, you know, after I put the kids to bed, finished my day job, like, no, it's just too much. Four blogs open, and this guy says to do that. I got an early copy of Docker before it went, went out. In less than eight minutes from the readme, from the install, I had a Docker run going. I was running containers. Second important, that by itself was amazing, but what's even more amazing is they took like a copy on write file, so they combined a whole bunch of stuff. So not just containers. So they created this way of now sharing artifacts, images. And you say, well, virtualization does that. Well, not really. Because Amazon, you have your own image. VMware, you have your own image. Um, uh, GCE, Google Compute, you have your own image. These guys basically put it in a way that I can run my binary image on my laptop, running something like Vagrant. I can move that up to Amazon for some intense smoke testing. I can then put it in production of vSphere. And if all went well, the binary never changes. So I have no entropy of converting this one to this one and doing that, right? So, and, and there's a lot more to that, that story in terms of how they do artifacts. And last but certainly not least, they added a Git-like flow. Which again was, I think, probably the most brilliant thing they did. You do pull requests, you do push. So that, they, they, they created this artifact that's universal. Build once, run anywhere. Ha. And then, by the way, an amazing way, what better way than to use a Git workflow to... to uh. And so here, if, you know, I'm going to kind of skip. i got five minutes later. But the big thing about containers in general and Docker is that you're not replicating the operating system every time. So for those of you who know Solaris Zones, you knew this story already. So adjustments required. I would, I would argue that there is a game, I think that compute is going to change. We, we're going through a paradigm shift in compute that is going to be insane. And I think it's going to happen faster than the last couple of, like even private cloud. I think, I think consumable infrastructure, there's a perfect marriage between containers and microservices. And both of those are reality. Like, yes, they're buzzwords, but they're reality. So when you start thinking about composable infrastructure or microservices in a way that you can build these things that are interchangeable, and you marry that with a, a, a compute paradigm that basically takes 500 milliseconds to come up and come down. And by the way, if you haven't read anything from Dave McCrory, who's over at Basho, who talks about data gravity, and get your bingo cards out, you add on IoT, which is going to create an incredible amount of data. You know, I mean, talk to somebody at Nike and ask them about the Fitbit and where all the data's going. Right? And then you put all that together, and now you've got this unbelievable perfect storm between, guess what, data gravity is this concept of we used to move data to the compute, now we move compute to data. Because guess what, data's gotten too big to move. Right? And, and so now you have this concept of really composable infrastructure. You can compute swarm around the data. Microservices as your architecture, so it's very composable. You can build things quick. You can build them, destructure them. Like, again, like, like if you're not thinking about this, there are people in your labs. Everybody I spoke to, I'm, I'm like everybody I ask, every enterprise, what are you doing in Docker? I've gotten, nobody has told me yet, and I've probably spoke to 50 people already, different enterprises, everybody has got Docker in the lab. So what do we do here? We have to rethink configuration management. I will tell you, um, Glenn next will probably hopefully talk a little about this when he talks about SDI. Um, Glenn is awesome. Um, the, we, we are myopic about compute. Like, like, we need to level up the other parts of the infrastructure, storage and network. There's a concept of what they call ready state networks. Most of you are probably already were aware of ready state compute, right? Things like Razor or just pixie booting, like, oh, we can electricity turn our computers on. Well, there are companies now that basically pull in racks, 
drop down wires, put them in, electricity, and the whole thing is configured. And guess what? They can actually ephemeral racks. So that means the network devices, so we have, you know, we talked about in the early days of, of DevOps, we called it, can you throw your server out the sixth floor test? There are companies now that say, can you throw your switch out the sixth floor test? Because it's the same idea. SDLC for networks. Guess what, folks? There are people building network configs in Git, running them through ERB templating, basically running them into Jenkins, running testing scenarios, and using virtual switches to run some form of TDD. I'm going to sound real like an asshole here, third joke. Like, 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 if you don't know that's happening out in your competitors, like, you probably want to go look. We ran an event last week called uh, DevOps for Networking. We need to make this transparent for developers. Like, again, remember that gap? Network has to be part of that shrinking gap. I want network people to be able to do, to get complex network scenarios without having bottlenecks and roadblocks. So just here's some things. I'm really running low on time. Um, you know, the, Gene talked about the cookbook. We talked about embedded ops into dev. Well, you should be embedding that ops. Um, uh, uh, Damon Edwards, uh, those guys are pretty much experts on this value stream mapping. If you have the value stream mapping, um, think about the pull mentality. Git is a good tool. Invite your NetOps to hack days. Hey, how about that? Um, and you know, let the net network people have fun too, right? Like I go into these places and even enterprise, they're like Nerf pistols and all this stuff. What are network people? Oh, they're at the dungeon on the second floor in the basement, right? Like let them have fun too. Invite them. All right, so Gene asked every speaker to make a plea, right? And but I'm going to kill it. 52 seconds. This is awesome. Um, the, so uh, basically, my plea is I spent the last 10 years trying to be an evangelist on compute. I've done a pretty good job. Um, I, I was at Ops Code. I then you know, did stuff with DTO. And, um, and now I'm making, a, a year ago, I got this religion about network. So I, I want you all, and it's self-serving. Yes, I, I have a company like this helps me. But I had the same mentality with, with Ops Code. But it worked out well for people um, in, in that evangelism. So I will tell you, go find the network people. Like, as much enthusiasm as you've had today in the last few days about what's going on here, like, get them enthused about this as well. It, it, it will be a much better story for you. I guarantee it. Thank you very much.